the book of Genesis chapter 12, we're going to begin there. The nations will be blessed through Abraham's lineage. Now, if I get through all 55 points, which I seriously doubt, but if I get to that point, I will be able to explain why all of these points are so important. But the, but the first prophecy regarding Messiah was that the nations of the world would be blessed through Abraham's lineage. Now, this is the way we're going to do this. I'm going to give the prophecy, and then I'm going to give the fulfillment with, with the point of that prophecy. Is everybody with me? So I'm, I'm going to give the point, I'm going to give the prophecy, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to give you book, chapter, and verse of fulfillment. Number one, the nations of the world will be blessed through Abraham's lineage. The prophecy of that is found in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. This is what the Bible says. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So there's a prophecy regarding a promise of blessing through the lineage of Abraham. The fulfillment of that is found in Acts chapter 3, verses 25 and 26. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with, with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Acts chapter 3 verses 25 and 26. Again, the prophecy to Abraham was the nations of the world shall be blessed through your lineage and that came to pass in Acts chapter 3. Is everybody with me? Prophecy number two, God's covenant would be with Isaac's ancestors. Isaac specifically. This is what the prophecy says in Genesis 17 and 19. Then God said, yes, but your wife Sarah shall bear you a son and you will call his name Isaac. I will establish, notice now, I will establish my covenant with him, not Ishmael. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants that come after him. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 19. The fulfillment of that is found in Romans chapter 9 and verse 7. Nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children, but rather on the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. So the, so the reconciliation or, or the reckoning or the reuniting of the peoples of the earth would, would come through the offspring of Isaac specifically and not Ishmael. Prophecy number three, the nations will be blessed through Jacob's offspring. Notice there's a prophecy to Abraham, there, there's a prophecy to Isaac, and now there's a prophecy to who? To Jacob, to Israel. This is what the scripture says in, in Genesis 28 and 14. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and through your offspring. Genesis 28 and 14. The fulfillment of that, uniquely enough, is found specifically in the lineage of Jesus. Now, I've, I've shared this before, but I want to stop and teach here. The reason why the book of Numbers is so important to the life of a Jew or to one who was Hebrew was they wanted to ensure that their lineage went all the way back to Abraham through Noah. The Bible says regarding the days of Noah, whenever the flood came, it said that Noah was found to be righteous in his generations. That did not mean that he was, that he was perfect or sinless. It meant that his genetic coding had not been tampered with, Genesis chapter 6. And so whenever the, to, the, to the Jew, to the Hebrew, whenever they go back and they look at their lineage, they trace their lineage all the way back through to Noah to Abraham. Is everybody with me? All the way back through. Why? Because they are validating who they are in their lineage and in their ancestry. This is why in the genealogy of Jesus, it is so important for us to understand that Luke chapter 3 is critical to validating who Jesus is. Is everybody with me? Right? So, Jacob is a part of, Je of Jesus' genealogy. Luke chapter 3 and verse 34. The, and the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor. So Jesus' lineage goes all the way back through. And notice now, say it with me, three blessings. 
You have three blessings. You have the blessing on Abraham, the blessing on Isaac, and the blessing on Jacob. And notice now, there was a prophetic de decree placed over every one of them in succession all the way down to Jesus. This is why we can't just know about our Bible. We got to know our Bible. Is everybody with me? Bible prophecy is important. So it was a fulfillment of the promise of God in Genesis regarding the genealogy of Jesus found in Luke chapter 3 and in verse 34. Interesting, isn't it? Now, I understand that tonight is a little bit different, and I'm not running and slinging all and snotting everywhere. But <laughs> But I'm trying to challenge us, friends, because in, in the day and age in which that we live, we need to know the Bible, specifically prophecy, because it is, it is very critical. No, number four, the scepter will come from Judah. Say authority. The authority of Messiah shall come from Judah. The prophecy of that is found in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10. This is what the Bible says. The scepter will not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nation shall be his. Now, why is that so important? Because the Bible says in the book of the Revelation that the lamb slain before the very th foundations of the world shall take up a rod and what? He shall rule the nations with a rod of iron right? A scepter of authority in the earth, and it shall not depart from what? From that lineage, from that spe uh, specific uh, uh, lineage. And so, that's Genesis 49 and 10. The fulfillment of that, again, genealogy is so important, is found in Luke 3 and 33. This is what the Bible says regarding Judah being a part of Jesus' uh, genealogy. And the son of Abinadab, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah. So again, Jesus is validated not just prophetically, he's confirmed genealogically. So it's not just somebody claiming to be somebody because a few factors might line up. Well, I'm from the tribe of Judah or, or, or from this lineage or, or from that. Friends, all of this lines up genealogically for Jesus. Number five, David's offspring will have an eternal kingdom. Shout an eternal one. Friends, Jesus has not come yet. The, th the millennial reign, we're not there yet. We're not in the middle of the tribulation period. There's all the, oh, well, we're in the middle of the third seal. No, we're not. Because if we were in the middle of the breaking of seals, then how is it that half the world's population has not been killed in the last three and a half years? which is what your Bible says, that almost half the world's population will, we're talking mega death on a scale that world history has never recorded. And that's not happening right now. This is why we have to know our Bible so that we're not deceived, which is why I'm slowing down and teaching a little bit on this tonight. David's offspring will have an eternal kingdom. The prophecy of that is found in 2 Samuel chapter 7 in verse 12 and 13. Notice what it says here. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to secede you. Notice, secede genealogically. Your own flesh and blood. It's not just about secession. It's of the same lineage of your own flesh and blood. And I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. Notice now forever. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. Again, the genealogy of Jesus, the fulfillment of that is found in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Notice now, the son of promise of kingship, that a kingdom shall be established forever and ever, and then the son of promise of authority in the earth through the Abrahamic covenant. Again, genealogy is excruciatingly important when it comes to Bible prophecy. Why? Because God was, spe was specific even down to the tribe from which Messiah was to come from. So if genealogy mattered enough for Bible prophecy to be included in that, then we need to consider that as credible proof to show that Jesus is who he said he was and still is.
Moving forward, point number six, a virgin shall give birth and he will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. The prophecy of that is found in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call his name Emmanuel, Isaiah chapter 7. The fulfillment of that is found in Luke chapter 1 and verse 35. And the angel answered, and the Holy Spirit shall come upon you and the power of the Most High shall overshadow you. So the Holy One born to you will be called the Son of God, Luke, Luke chapter 1 and verse 35. Now this is where it gets unique. Again, abstract prophecies that are unique specifically to this story. The Messiah will end up in Egypt. We think he was born in the manger, and then we think that he was about 20 minutes old, and then the, and then the wise men show up. That's not the case. Jesus had to have been at least a year and a half to two years of age whenever the wise men showed up because what, what happened? The king got mad it said, when did you see this star? And they gave a potential timeline. After he realized that the wise men had deceived him and didn't come back and tell him where this Messiah was, he ordered everybody, all the children what? And under to be killed. So Jesus was not, ah! wise men show up. Right? Right? And so there was a fleeing. Isn't it unique though? The wise men show up and what do they bring? They, they bring gifts, one of which was gold. And then what happens? He flees to Egypt. Why? Because God supernaturally sent resources to ensure that his son and the family was going to be taken care of in Egypt so, so they had resources to hide themselves. God always out, outthinks the enemy, right? Moving forward, the Messiah shall wind up in Egypt. Hosea prophesied that in Hosea 11 and verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt, notice now, I called my son. Hosea 11 and 1. But the fulfillment of that is found in Matthew 2, 14 and 15. So he, Joseph, got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and what? Left for Egypt, where, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And was so fulfilled what the Lord said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. Again, unique abstract prophecies that at face value, you go, wait just a second. That, I, I don't understand why, why would that directly or indirectly affect Messiah? But friends, it's all a part of his story. Prophecy number eight, the child Christ will, will be born in Bethlehem. Micah 5 and 2, but you... Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, notice now, Judah, small amongst the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me one who will rule over Israel, notice now, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Now, why is that so important? Because in the book of the Revelation, whenever John begins to weep, what does he say? He says, where is one who's worthy to open, to, to, to take up the scrolls and begin to open? And the angel says, why do you weep? For behold, there is a lamb, the lamb slain before the very foundations of the world. So you take that in context to this passage of Scripture. What does it say? It says, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Now, Micah, this is, a, this is probably a 3,500 to 4,000-year-old prophecy from where we stand right now. And Micah was told that the one that's going to come forth is from old. So this would... <laughs> This was a statement of prophetic future based off of an unknown prophetic past. Is everybody with me? But then this is where the scripture is fulfilled. When, when he had called together all, the, all of the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah would be born, in Bethlehem and Judah. 
And they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least amongst the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler, what now, that will shepherd my people Israel. Matthew chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. Again, supernatural prophecy, supernatural fulfillment. Number nine, Christ's ministry will destroy the devil's work. The, the ministry of Messiah would have the power to destroy the works of the enemy. A, kind of a unique thing. Amongst rabbinical teaching, it was recorded that there were only certain miracles that Messiah could perform. One specific miracle was to cast the devil out of a deaf, mute person. Because according to demonology and exorcism teachings amongst the, the priesthood, that a person had to be able to communicate and so that the wicked spirit could communicate through them and so that the exorcist could take authority over the name of the demon and cast it out. This is the reason why when Jesus interacts with the man of Gadara, what does Jesus say? What is your name? And the demoniac re responds and says, legion, for we are what? We are many. One of the rabbinical teachings regarding Messiah that would separate the supernatural power of Messiah from your normal priest who casts demons out of people. You have to understand that Jesus casting devils out was nothing new. Demonic possession didn't magically manifest whenever Jesus began to walk in ministry in the earth. Again, we have to look at things properly. Jesus came to, to destroy the work of the devil. Genesis 3 and 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, I will, and he will crush your head and you will strike at his heel. Genesis 3 and 15, but the fulfillment of that is found in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been what? Has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work or to destroy the work of the devil. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. Again, a prophecy given by God at the moment of the fall with Adam and Eve and the serpent in the garden in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. We fast forward all the way to 1 John chapter 3 and John says the reason that Jesus stepped into the earth was to destroy the works of the devil. What? Fulfilling the prophecy of the Father. Soon shall come a man from a woman's seed. You shall strike at his heel, but he shall bust your head. Again, prophecy, manifestation. Number 10, I know y'all like, we got 55 to go. I ain't going to cover all of them. I'm just teaching. Is that all right? I'm just teaching. Jesus will have a sinless, blemish-free life and ministry. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 5. The animals you choose must be year-old males without de defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Exodus 12 and 5. Hebrews 9 and 14, this is what it says. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself, what now, unblemished unto God, cleanse our consciences from the acts that led to death so that we may serve the living God. Again, a sinless ministry, a sinless life, a sinless death. Jesus had to be perfect. This is the reason why the immaculate conception had to take place. He could not be born from a fallen soul in a body and a fallen soul in a body of the consummation of two fallen people. He had to be born from a virgin wound by the power of the Holy Ghost supernaturally. And I'm going to take it a step further. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God is not just discussing the destruction of Satan. He's also referencing to the virgin birth because of what does the text say. And soon shall come a man from a woman's seed. You look at your scripture, the seed of Abraham, the seed of Isaac, 
the seed of Jacob, the seed of Jesse, the, the, the seed of David. There is never in your Bible a record of a seed from a woman because a woman doesn't bear a seed. The man through procreation bears seed. The woman bears the womb. So people who say, well, the virgin birth, that whole teaching is a New Testament theology. No, it's not, because according to the very words of God himself in the garden, there was going to come a man from a woman's seed that the enemy would strike at his heel, but he would have the power to crush his head. Bible prophecy. This is why we've got to know these things. This is why I'm slowing down and teaching a little bit. Anybody learning anything tonight? Right? Am I challenging you? Number 11, the, the Messiah will be humbled in order to serve mankind. Psalm 8, verses 5 and 6. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. Fulfillment. Hebrews 2, verses 5 and 9. It is not the angels that he was subjected the world to, to come about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified, what is mankind that thou art mindful of them or a son of a man that you care for him for you've made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor. You've put everything under their feet and putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them, but we do see Jesus. Lord, have mercy. We don't see everything, but we do see Jesus, who, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everybody. Again, what is man that thou art mindful of him, nor the, the son of man that you would pay him any mind? For thou hast created him and made him a little lower than the angels and yet made everything subject to him. Friends, the death of Jesus was temporary because Jesus is not was. He is and always shall be is in the present tense. Again, he was created to be humbled to serve mankind. Again, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, it says that it's, this is the way that it says it. It says that we have not a high priest who has not been touched with, with the feelings of our infirmities. For in like Likewise, and in all manners was he tested and yet found without sin. Let me just break it down for you. How can someone mediate for you if they don't understand you? And Jesus, the great theanthropus, the God-man, who was made to be a little lower than the angels, but yet everything was made subject to him, he became like us. And so that he could represent us. And so that he could have grace for what he was dying for. Because he could not represent us if he did not understand us. Could it be the very reason why he had no problem touching a leper? Because he never knew what leprosy felt like until he touched the leper and ran his fingers through the pus that came off of that person's body. And while he's what? Being touched with the feelings of our fleshly infirmities, the man he's now touched has been healed. That, that's good, isn't it? That he that was made a little lower than the angels has now been put in a place where everything is subject to him. And I'm going to take it a step further. Whenever you look at the book of the Revelation and it's talking about the, you know, the scroll with the seals, friends, that is a Hebrew idiom of the title deed to the earth. That's why John said he recognized it. He knew what it was. He says, who's worthy to open the scroll? Notice now, to redeem the earth. And he begins to weep. Who's worthy to open the scroll? He knew what it was. And what, what happened? The angel said, why are you weeping? For don't you know that there's a lamb? And he came and what did he do? He took up the scroll and he starts to breach 
the seals. Oh, I feel like preaching tonight and I, I need to be teaching. Number 13, Jesus would, would preach righteousness to Israel. Psalm 40 and 9, I proclaim your, your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. Fulfillment of that, Matthew 4 and 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of God has come near. Notice, what was John saying? Jesus' language changed. John said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus says, repent for now the kingdom of God has come near. It's not touchable, it's now right here. It's not arm's length away, it's right here, it's near. The, the fulfillment of that, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Matthew 4 and 17. N number 14, Jesus would teach in parables. Again, an obscure prophecy regarding M Messiah. Why would Messiah teach in parable? Psalm 78 in verse 1 and 2. My people hear my teachings, listen to the words of my mouth. Notice now, I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things. What now? Things from old. Psalm 78 verses 1 and 2. Matthew 13 and 34 and 35, this, this is what it said. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. Notice now, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. So unique. Again, a prophecy in Psalm chapter 78 is made manifest in the life and ministry of Jesus, literally in Matthew chapter 13 in verse 34 and 35. Number 15, Christ's parables would fall on deaf ears. This is what the prophecy said. He said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Isaiah 6, verses 9 and 10. But the fulfillment of this is Matthew 13, 13 through 15. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Notice how Jesus is pulling from Scripture and he's tying himself to it. Y'all are asking why I'm teaching in parables. I can tell you why. Because the prophecy about me is coming to pass. And you're hearing me, but you're not listening. You're seeing me, but yet you're not perceiving. You have insight, but no understanding whatsoever. How is that the case? Notice Jesus goes on to say here, you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You, you will be ever seeing but never perceiving for this people's hearts have become callous and they hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts in turn and I would heal them. Isn't it unique whenever Jesus makes this statement to the Pharisees? He says, regarding Moses and the Torah, in them you seek eternal life. But yet if you knew who was talking to you, you would know that who Moshe, Moses was talking about is standing in front of you. But yet with all this knowledge, you do not perceive. But yet in all of my miracles of you seeing, you still do not believe because your hearts have been calloused. Isn't it unique with that in mind, that gives us insight to why the Pharisees constantly said, show us a sign, work us a miracle. Even on the cross, if you were the Messiah, bring yourself down that we may worship you. Notice, it's a constant taunting to manifest a miracle, but even Jesus said, no, no, no matter what I say, you're not listening. No matter what I do, you're not perceiving. And no matter how much knowledge you have, you're still deceived because your hearts are wrong. 
Again, prophecy. Next one. The Messiah would, would be a stone that causes people to stumble. The prophecy of that is Isaiah 8 and verse 14. He will be a holy place for both Israel and Judah. He will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Friends, this is the reason why in light of this text that you don't need to get offended whenever people tune you out. You don't need to get upset whenever you're trying to minister the gospel to somebody and they shut you down. Do not get offended or upset because here's the deal. They're offended at the message. Why? Because Isaiah prophesied that they would. What you're seeing whenever people act that way is a manifestation of Bible prophecy. Just take it as a confirmation that what his word said is right. Isaiah 8 and 14, notice it says here that it will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Isn't it unique? A trap and a snare. Whenever they asked Jesus about the end times, specifically about what was to come, he turns in references to the temple mount and says, soon shall come a day upon which that the temple shall not stand and no stone shall stand upon another. Jesus prophesied that around 30 to 34 AD. By 70 AD, Titus and the 10th legion is marching on Jerusalem, destroys the temple mount, and what? Starts throwing the stones off of top of one of another. And the diaspora happened. Friends, oh Jesus, not only is Jesus the manifestation of prophecy, he himself is batting a thousand with every prophecy he ever gave. And another caveat, if you get my notes and you study them, and I encourage you to do so, these are 55 prophecies that have already happened. I'm not taking into account Isaiah's prophecies of the last days and Daniel's prophecies of 70 weeks and Ezekiel 38 and 39 and the book of the Revelation and Matthew chapter 24. What I'm sharing with you is stuff that's already happened many of which these prophecies were thousands of years old whenever they came to pass. And, and the fulfillment of that is found in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 7. Christ's ministry, is it okay if I just go into warp speed? I'm just going to just reference scriptures and y'all can go back and pull my verse. Because I'm only on 17. I've got 55. Cut me a break. I know I could preach this over five Wednesdays. Christ's ministry would begin in Galilee. That was prophesied in Isaiah 9. It was manifested in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, or uh, the 18th one. Jesus would draw Gentiles unto himself. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. The manifestation of that was in John chapter 12, verses 18 to 21. 19th prophecy, that Jesus would have a miraculous ministry. Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6, and the fulfillment of that was in Matthew chapter 2 and verse, verses 2 through 6. M Matthew 11, verses 2 through 6. The 20th prophecy, that the Messiah would be preceded by a forerunner. Again, an obscure prophecy, but that is who John the Baptist was, that there shall be a forerunner. Isaiah 40, verses, 30, ver verses 3 and 4, that the fulfillment of that was John 1, verses 20 verse 23. The 21st, pro the 21st prophecy, Jesus will, will be a gentle redeemer of the Gentiles. That was a prophecy found in Isaiah 42. The fulfillment of that is in Matthew chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. The 22nd prophecy was that Jesus would be despised and rejected, Isaiah 53 and 3. The fulfillment of that was Luke chapter 4, verses 28 and 29. 23, Jesus will set the captive free. Isaiah 61 and verse 1. The fulfillment of that is found in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 21. 24th prophecy. The, the Messiah will have a throne that is everlasting. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. The fulfillment of that is found in Luke chapter 1, verses 31 to 33. Is everybody mo moving with me here? Again, I'm going through this because I'm trying to show you that Jesus is who the Bible says he is.
And we don't just believe because pastor gets up here and shouts and, and we sing some good songs. We believe more than just by our faith. We believe by our knowing because it's impossible for any of this to divinely align the way it did had not God himself been involved. 25, the Messiah would, would, would bring an end to sin. Matthew chapter 9, verses 24. The fulfillment of that, Daniel 9, 25 and 26, and Galatians chapter 1, verse 3 through 5. The 26th prophecy, Jerusalem will rejoice as Messiah comes to her upon a donkey. Again, an obs why, why that? But again, a specific sign. No different than what the Bible said about the virgin. Behold, God himself shall give you a sign, something that is a clear picture of what he intends to do. He gives a prophecy about the Messiah coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. That was prophesied in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. That was fulfilled in Matthew 21 verses 8 through 10. Whenever they began to cast palm branches out in front of him and began to cry, Hosanna, who, who comes in the name of the Lord. Again, Judas was even prophesied of his act that it even records in your Bible that Jesus the Messiah would be betrayed, bit, bit, betrayed rather, for 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah 11, verses 12 through 13. I told them, if you think it best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver, and the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the handsome price at which that they valued me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them through the, to the potter at the house of the Lord. And isn't it funny that Judas receives 30 pieces of silver, he goes. He comes back and he demands that the priests take the money back. And they refused. And what does he do? He throws the money into the house of the Lord. The priests couldn't put it back into the temple treasury because it was blood money for an assassination. So what do they do? They go and they buy a field, which happens to be the same field that Judas goes and hangs himself in. Bible prophecy. All of these things were foretold. That was Zechariah 11 in prophecy. It was manifested in Matthew chapter 27. 28. I'm, I'm going to share two more and then y'all can read the other 25 at night tonight before y'all go to bed. Is everybody good? Christ's forerunner would come in the spirit of Elijah. Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 and 6. But this fulfillment of that was found in Matthew 11 verses 10 and 15. I'm going to land on this. Christ will be our Passover lamb. The prophecy is this. And Moses summoned all, the area, the, all of the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once, select the animals for, for your families, and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood in the basin, and put some, put some on the top of the, the blood on the top and on both sides of the door. Notice they didn't put it on the threshold. They put it on the top, put it on the sides. They didn't put it on the ground. Why? because the lamb's blood could not be trampled on. It was an act of dishonor. I'm going to keep teaching. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and on the sides of the door frame. And notice now, shall pass over, say over. He will pass over that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and for your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord has, will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. When your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean? Then they tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes whenever he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and they worshiped. Exodus chapter 12 verses 21 to 27. Notice now, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch, 
as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And I'm getting ready to close now. Like the Passover lamb, none of Christ's bones would be broken. Now, why is that so important? Because the lamb that was slaughtered at Passover could not be broken. It could only be sacrificed. They could not break the bones. They had to sacrifice it. They caught the blood. They applied the blood to the lentils of the house, to the top and to the sides. And then what did they do? The Bible says that they roasted the whole lamb. And according to ordinance, if your home, people living in there, if there was not enough people in your house to eat the lamb, you were to bring your neighbor to consume all of the lamb because it was dishonoring to not consume all of the lamb. Can I teach here for just a second? We need to learn that principle as believers in Jesus as well because it's not just about the blood of the lamb. It's about the heart of the lamb. It's about the mind of the lamb. It's about the walk of the lamb. It's about the strength of the lamb. It's not about us excusing ourselves and saying, well, you know what? I don't want to have the bowels of compassion of the lamb. I just want the parts of the lamb that I like. But if we're going to partake of Jesus as our Passover lamb, Brother Corey, if we're going to partake of him as our Passover lamb, we have to take all of Jesus and not just the parts about him that we enjoy. And in closing, the Passover lamb, none of Christ's bones will, will be broken. Again, friends, there's so much of the Bible. You, you just like the Lord. You just showed up right on time. <laughs> Praise the Bible. What I'm talking about. I'm going to give you a couple of points of reference, and then I'm going to get ready to close. The Old and the New Testament are valuable only when both of them are actively included together. We, we cannot say, well, we are New Testament believers. Wait just a second. You understand that the new exists, first of all, because there was an old one. And the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Even down to the prophetic utterances about Messiah of not even a bone being broken. Even to the prophecy of Messiah dying on a tree, that prophecy was delivered almost 1,800 years before the Romans ever even came up with the idea of crucifixion. And if you study anything about Roman crucifixion, after they scourged you and they nailed you, after a time, I'm not being crude here, just, just go, if you wouldn't hurry up and die, they would help you. They would not pierce you until they were sure you were dead. But they, if they thought you were alive, they would break your legs below your knees. So you could not hold the weight of your body up while being crucified because the worst part of crucifixion was asphyxiation. You would literally smother to death on your own body fluids. So the only way to breathe was to push up. So the soldiers would take clubs and break your legs where you couldn't do that. Jesus is on the cross and they assume he's dead, but they didn't break his legs. They pierced his side. That prophecy goes all the way back to Exodus chapter 12. It must be eaten inside the house. Take none of the meat outside of the house. Do not break any of the bones. That's Bible. Again, type and shadow. It was a foreshadowing of things to come. I get so excited about this kind of stuff, I can throw my pulpit and just take off running and grab a banner and start throwing oil and shouting. 
I'm getting ready to close, I promise. Now, it was the day of preparation. The next day was the special Sabbath, middle of the week, a Wednesday, because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath or a high Sabbath. They asked Pilate, notice now, to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those on, of the other. So each side... But when they came to Jesus and found he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. Friends, they didn't break his legs because God said they wouldn't. They didn't break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with, with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of what? Of blood and water. And the man who saw it has given, has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that, that he tells the truth, and he testifies so, so that you may also believe. These things happen, notice now, so the Scripture would be fulfilled according to Exodus chapter 12. Not one of his bones shall be broken. Oh, that ought to make you shout and want to run and... Now, friends, why is all of that important? Because Jesus is our Passover lamb. That's just 30 prophecies out of 55 in this resource that I encourage you to go and read and study on because that's 55 prophecies that have already happened, which tells me that guess what? The Father and the righteous lamb of God is batting a thousand when it comes to Bible prophecy. And there's other things that the scripture prophesied that are forthcoming. They foretold things. Why? As a foreshadowing, even to the place of detail, that our Passover lamb would not even have his legs broke. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Genesis, a man shall come from a woman's seed. You shall strike his heel, but he will bust your head. Matthew chapter 1. Exodus chapter 12. Death is coming and judgment's coming. And the only way for the judgment of God to pass over is if the blood of the lamb is applied and you consume the sacrifice that the lamb may be in you. Exodus chapter 12. Thou shalt take it into thy house and consume it therein in thy dwelling. Thou shalt not bring it forth out from thy door, but remain in the house. Thou shalt consume all of the lamb but ensure that you do not break a bone. An obscure, weird instruction. But it was telling of Messiah when he hung on the cross, Frank Pilcher, and he died for our sins as our Passover lamb, and the lamb of God was, sus was suspended between heaven and earth, and his precious blood was spilt into the earth to the point that what was prophesied in Exodus chapter 12 had to come to pass in Matthew chapter 24 to 27. That even the bones of the lamb would not be broken. Based off of an instruction in Exodus chapter 12 as a precursor to a future history norm of how the Roman Empire would execute people. Thousands of years before the idea even originated to nail people to trees and break their legs, God gave a prophetic utterance about the Lamb of God, the Messiah that would to come, that he might hang on the tree, but his bones shall not be broken. That's like trying to fit the ocean in a bucket. 
but that's just one, Dr. Todd, that, that's just one sliver of the tapestry of the prophecies of Messiah. But God cared so much about details that he said, according to what I've instructed you is what will come to pass. And the land that was there at Passover in Exodus chapter 10 to 15 will be the same land that hangs on the tree, but the same standard still applies. His bones shall not be breaking, and he shall be fully consumed. His bones shall not be broken, and he shall be fully consumed. And don't you find it unique that it was Jesus who sat with his disciples? I'm running out of time. I'm just overflowing. He sits with his disciples and what does he say? This is the cup, the blood of the covenant. When you drink this, do this and remember, this is my body. In the teachings of Exodus chapter 12, manifested prophetically in the life of Jesus, even to the point of at his death, prophecy was still coming to pass. Now, I bring all that up to say this, and let this encourage you. If the Father cared enough to prophesy to the most in detail regarding the prophecies of Messiah, and they happened just like he said, if God pays that much attention to his own son, my Bible also says that he knows the number of hairs on every one of your heads. If he paid that much attention to Jesus and made it happen, don't count him out when it comes to what he's proph prophesied over your life and over your children and over your marriage and over your home and over your body. Because friends, even when it looked like Jesus lost, what the world called a loss was his greatest victory. This is why the Bible says if the rulers and the wicked leaders of this dark age, if they had known, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory because what they thought they were doing was stopping Jesus. They were actually releasing prophetic destiny in Jesus. Because the Son of God was now able to be born as a Son of Man. But as the Son of God could die in our place, that we as sons and daughters of men would have the opportunity to partake of our Passover lamb just as they did in Egypt in Exodus chapter 12 and receive the blood of the lamb on our life that the judgment and the death judgment of God would pass over us and then we would partake and consume the lamb that we might become like him.